All right, I think we are at 4.30 on the dot. Welcome everybody to the ASB award session where we're honoring the Goyle, Pytel, and Founders Award winners. Before we get started, I want to remind you all to rename your names if you haven't already to your actual name. And if you plan on asking a question in the chat, um, it could be helpful if you wanna put your institution name there, we can also mention that as well. Um, for, for asking questions, please put it in the chat. Um, we'll be monitoring this and then we'll be um, reading those aloud on your behalf and we will try to get to everybody that we can but we know that we'll have to pick and choose um, questions that are not asked and the full chat menu will be transitioned over to the slack discussion which will um, also be active during the talks um, i'm missy morrow you're the awards chair for um, asb and i'm joined by my co-moderator brian umberger the asb past president and it's just really a pleasure to be able to uh, to introduce this session and bring us into these wonderful, wonderful um, presentations today. I do want to begin first by honoring and uh, naming our 2020 Borelli Award winner. The Borelli Award recognizes outstanding career accomplishments and is awarded annually to investigators have, who have conducted exemplary research in any area of biomechanics. And Stephen Messier is our 2020 winner from Wake Forest University. Steve has decided to delay his talk to 2021, so we are very excited for next year to be able to hear about his achievements through his career studying knee osteoarthritis. I will run through the three award winners now before we, we hear their individual talks. The Goyle Award for Translational Research in Biomechanics uh, recognizes outstanding accomplishments in translational biomechanics research, entrepreneurship, and societal benefit and is named in honor of Vijay Goyle. And our 2020 winner this year is Shroya Attar from the University of Michigan. The Jean Landa Pytel Award for Diversity and Mentorship in Biomechanics recognizes the long-term impact of mentoring on both of careers and individual scientists, including women and individuals from other traditionally underrepresented backgrounds. And our 2020 winner is Jill McNick Gray from the University of Southern California. And this award is named for Jean Landa Pytel, um, who was uh, really a visionary in mentoring women in, in biomechanics and engineering and was a founding member of ASB. And our Founders Award, it recognizes scientific accomplishment in biomechanics and excellence in mentoring. And our 2020 winner is Tammy Reed Bush from Michigan State University. So first we'll move into the Goyle Award and I'll be introducing um, our, our winner this year. Shroya Attar is an Associate Professor of Mechanical Engineering at the University of Michigan and the inventor, founder, and Chief Scientific Officer of Flextex Surgical. His research interests include machine design, parallel kinematics, and human machine biomechanical interfaces to name a few. He's a fellow of ASME in addition to his active teaching schedule and research schedule, he works with the Ann Arbor Hands-On Museum to create educational exhibits for children in K through 12. Today, Professor Attar is going to share his experience in translational biomechanics for his Goyle Award talk entitled Flextex, from Kinematics Research to Clinical Impact. Welcome, Professor Attar. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Missy. Let me make sure I can share my screen. I believe I'm sharing my screen. Uh, I'll stop sharing my video. Okay. Um, so, uh, hello everyone, and thanks again, Missy, for the kind introduction. Uh, I want to start by saying that I'm deeply honored to receive the Goyle Award for Translational Research in Biomechanics. In particular, Professor Vijay Goyal is an inspiration and role model for numerous researchers like me working to make an impact in the field of bioengineering. So here I am today to tell you about the story of Flextex, how we went from basic research in kinematics and human machine interface all the way to clinical impact. Let me make sure my screen works here. Okay, so let me play this video to demonstrate Flextex, which is a low cost surgical instrument designed as a seamless, harmonious extension of the human hand with the goal of providing enhanced dexterity, intuitive control, and ergonomics in minimally invasive surgery. Let's hope this video is okay.
So what you saw in this video is a compact, purely mechanical, handheld technology that is now available in over two dozen countries, and it's helping bring the benefits of minimally invasive surgery to all segments of the society that previously could not afford it. As many of you might already know, minimally invasive surgery is surgery that is performed via tiny incisions on the patient's body. It's also known as laparoscopic surgery. Here I'm showing you the example of a procedure called colon resection that can be performed in an open traditional manner or via laparoscopy. This procedure involves cutting out and removing a section of the colon shown here that may have a tumor and the remaining portion of the colon will have to be reattached via careful suturing and knot tying that you see there. When done via open surgery, the resulting incision and scar looks something like this. In contrast, when done via laparoscopy, the incisions are much smaller. This results in reduced scarring, blood loss, fewer infections, less post-operative pain, faster recovery time, shorter hospital stays, and overall lower healthcare costs. As a result of these benefits, more and more procedures are now performed in a minimally invasive manner. But a key question that remains is, what are the tools and instruments that the surgeon has to be able to perform these procedures in minimally invasive manner? So here I'm showing a set of laparoscopic instruments that are traditionally used. You see this long, narrow shaft that is inserted through a small incision on the patient's body. You see uh, various different types of tips that have different functionality. What you don't see is any wrist articulation at this instrument tip. And that is why these instruments are also called straight stick instruments. The lack of dexterity of these instruments make them really difficult to use, especially in complex laparoscopic procedures that require intensive suturing, like what I showed on the previous slide, where the two ends of the, uh, of the remaining uh, colon had to be attached to each other. Now, it takes to, to use these instruments, straight stick instruments, it requires specialized training over several years for a surgeon to get proficient at using them, and only a fraction of surgeons are ever able to become experts. Now, in response to the need for wristed articulation, a whole bunch of designs have been proposed, of which some have made it to the market, like the two instances that I'm showing here. As you can see here, the tip in these instruments does articulate. The tip does articulate, but the control of this articulation by the user is highly non-intuitive. And given this compromised ergonomics, none of these designs gain clinical traction. And these two companies here that I mentioned, along with many others, have actually gone out of business. So what are the alternatives? Well, the elephant in the room that I'm sure most of you are aware of is robotic surgery. And the most prevalent one is the Da Vinci system from Intuitive Surgical. This robotic system provides enhanced dexterity at the instrument tip that is intuitively controlled by a surgeon sitting at a remote console, as is shown here. The robot provides master follower functionality whereby the hand movements of the surgeon are captured via a joystick here and are replicated by the robot arms operating inside the patient. There's no doubt that this is an amazing technology, but it also comes with an amazing price tag that not only includes capital expenditure, but also annual service contracts. There's an additional cost of a few thousand dollars per procedure in terms of consumables. Given the complexity of the system, setting it up in an OR for every procedure is time consuming. For a surgeon to become proficient at robotic surgery also requires extensive training and certification. Finally, there's a lack of haptic feedback, at least in the commercially available solutions and what that means is that surgeon doesn't feel the forces applied by the robotic arms on the tissues and organs inside the patient. So this is where we stand. The cost concerns are, are, of robotics is, is a major issue that has been highlighted uh, by many clinical publications. I'm just showing you a handful here. Each one of them talks about the incremental clinical advantage, if any, and yet the high cost. So for example, here you see uh, with a robotic procedure, similar morbidity, but increased cost. Here you see robots offer little added benefit, but cost one third more. Yet again, emphasis on cost. Yet again, a Johns Hopkins study finds these robotic surgery just as effective as laparoscopy, but more expensive. So overall, there are these cost concerns. 
It is true that robotic surgery is an amazing technology and its use has been growing rapidly for a variety of reasons and it's here to stay. However, it is also a reality that several rural and community hospitals in the US are unable to afford the multi-million dollar price tag and even more so around the world, developed as well as emerging markets find the cost of robotics to be prohibitive. So what this tells us is that the surgeons and hospitals have a tough choice to make. On one hand, you have traditional mechanical instruments that are affordable, but provide limited functionality uh, that is needed in advanced laparoscopic procedures. On the other hand, you have robotic solutions that provide amazing functionality, but at a prohibitive price point. That begs the question for an engineer, for an inventor, a researcher, how can we achieve the robotic functionality at the price point of traditional mechanical instruments? This is the wide open space that remains to be filled. Now, when, um, whenever faced with such deep questions, there's one place to go to for guidance and advice, right? Uh, for the Star Wars fans in the audience, they'll know what I'm talking about, okay? The wisdom of Yoda says, do or do not, there is no try. In other words, just go for it. To me, this challenge that I, I presented, the societal need that I described on the previous slides, seemed to be truly worthwhile pursuit. Uh, that when I started out as a faculty at the University of Michigan more than a decade ago, and I decided to take it on. In doing so, as the first step, it was important to understand where does the problem truly lie? I showed you examples of instruments uh, that provide wrist-like dexterity at the tip, like you see here, but have still failed in the clinical setting. And these are you know, some of the companies that have produced these um, uh, products. But the reason these have failed is because that the problem does not lie at the tip, rather the problem lies at the user interface. Notice that to articulate the end effector down, the user has to articulate the wrist upward and to articulate the end effector up, the user has to articulate the wrist downward. This is highly counterintuitive. Moreover, notice that the forearm does not remain in alignment with the tool shaft and keeps moving around depending on how you articulate the end effector. This leads to a highly non-ergonomic user experience. And again, why does this happen? This happens because of a fundamental kinematic incompatibility between the user and the tool. And what do I mean by that? Well, the tool has its own input joint. As you see here, it's, in, it's a sort of a universal joint, an articulation joint. This is the input joint of the tool. On the other hand, the user has their own input joint, their own wrist. And the fact that they are separated in space creates this kinematic incompatibility. What is the ideal? situation? Well, the ideal situation is if the center of rotation of the tool input joint and the center of rotation of the user input joint can be co-located, like I'm showing here, that will resolve the kinematic incompatibility, but that pose, poses uh, a basic question. How do you create a mechanical joint, a tool input joint, at a location where there already is a user joint in terms of the user bones, flesh, muscles, and tendons? How do you do that? To accomplish this, we drew inspiration from the concept of virtual centers of rotation. As you would all appreciate, in any machine or mechanism, there are real centers of rotation. So this axis and this, the physical components here, provide a center of rotation that is in the same location as where the mechanical and the physical components are. But in contrast, I'll show you an example where there's a vehicle, when you turn the steering, when you turn the steering, the entire vehicle starts rotating about a point in space. That's not inside the vehicle. The center of rotation is, is located at some remote location. And the kinematics of the steering mechanism is such that you can produce, you can project a center of rotation out in open space. So that is the concept of virtual center. And that is what we ended up exploiting in the FlexTex design. What I did was, if you look at this mechanism, this is the input joint of the FlexTex tool. And in this mechanism, I made use of these two transmission strips with unique compliance properties and the two pulleys that you see at the base. The axes of these two pulleys, if you were to extrapolate them, they intersect at a virtual center in space. This is the center of rotation of the tool input joint, which is projected into empty space. And now it can be co-located with the wrist of the user. 
This eliminates the kinematic incompatibility that I mentioned previously. Additionally, these strips, this is part of a parallel kinematic, a very unique design that helps resolve the two rotations of the user's wrist into pitch only rotation at this pulley and your only rotation at that pulley, which then helps facilitate a simple cable-based transmission of these rotations from the tool input to the end effector at the distal end of the tool. So now, ultimately, all of this led to the full device that I'm showing here with several features. What is unique is that you see the tool shaft is actually connected to the forearm via a, a, a gimbal mounting. So this is, I, I show this in a schematic manner here, where the tool shaft is connected via frame to the forearm of the user. This means that the tool shaft is directly controlled by the forearm of the user, which is a fundamentally different architecture than any of the previous instruments that you would have seen. That is the forearm control. Next, the wrist of the user interfaces with the virtual center mechanism of the instrument that I showed you in the previous slide. That happens here. And then the handle, the, the hand, the, uh, the surgeon's hand interfaces with the handle that comprises a closure lever as well as a dial that enables 360 degree rotation. Because the tool architecture here that we have developed is one that is in kinematic harmony with the user such that both the tool and the user are considered part of the same biomechanical system. The result is that the FlexTex instrument precisely translates the surgeon's forearm, wrist, and hand motions to the instrument's tip, which is that tip inside the patient's body in a highly intuitive manner and via purely mechanical design. What I showed you in the previous slide, by the way, did not happen overnight. I want to give you some perspective of the timeline. It took 10 years and almost a dozen iterations to get to a clinical ready product. So in 2007, this is where we were. Further concept development, further prototype development, further refinement in 2010, better functionality. In 2013, 2014, we translated the research from the university lab to launch a company which is called Flextech Surgical. Even further prototype development, getting surgeon and user feedback, ultimately leading to this clinically ready product that was launched in 2017. And in particular, this instrument is a needle driver that is meant for suturing and knot tying, which is the most difficult laparoscopic task. One of the biggest procedures where FlexTex needle driver has been used now is in hernia repair surgery. And I'll just give you a quick idea of what hernia is. Uh, this is a condition under which the intestine pops out of the abdominal wall when the abdominal wall loses structural strength and the fix is to pull the, um, the intestine back in and to reinforce the wall, the abdominal wall, using a mesh. But you can appreciate when you put a mesh, you have to fixate the mesh inside the abdo abdomen. And to do that, you have to perform suturing all the way around the periphery of the mesh so that it, it stays in location. So now let me show you this comparison between the Da Vinci robot and FlexDex being used on the exact same procedure. This is lunchtime for my friends uh, on the West Coast, so uh, I hope it's not, um, it won't make you throw up. But, um, but you know, if, if in, in, in the interest of, of scientific inquiry, bear with me, please. This is the mesh that I was talking about that has been attached to the abdominal wall. And what's happening here is the peritoneum is now being closed. On the left-hand side, you see the Da Vinci robot and, and look at the articulation of the instrument tip. And on the right-hand side, look at FlexTex and yet again, the articulation of the instrument tip. The exact same procedure, the exact same outcomes. So what's the difference? The difference is $2 million price tag and a whole bunch of additional complexities and costs versus less than $1,000. In fact, the, the price of FlexTex ranges in different markets from $500 to $700 for a few hundred dollars, three orders of magnitude, less cost, the same procedure, same uh, outcomes are being produced. So this is where I started. This is the chart that I showed you earlier and I said, we want the functionality of the robot at the cost of traditional mechanical instruments and FlexTex did that, not just as a technology proof of concept, but in a true clinical setting. Now, what is that clinical setting? So here's an example of Dr. Kent Bowden, who's a surgeon at the Cadillac Hospital with Spartan in Healthcare, which is a small rural community hospital in northern Michigan. And he has done close to 500 procedures using FlexTex. Uh, in fact, this particular hospital, this is Tanya Smith, the president of the hospital. When Dr. Bowden 
adopted FlexX, they decided not to buy the DaVinci robot and instead completely embrace FlexX. The money they saved by not buying a robot, they used that money to build a fifth OR, thereby increasing the capacity by 20%. That was the impact of the capital cost. And the per use cost, this is a contribution margin. This is showing that if DaVinci were to be used for a given procedure, then the hospital ends up making a few hundred dollars at best. But if FlexTex is used for the same procedure, the hospital ends up saving. The margin it makes is several thousand dollars. So this is the financial impact. And there are other instances of this against small rural community hospitals. This is Dr. Peter Janum, who has done close to 200 procedures in a hospital um, in, in Wisconsin. Now, outside of the US, FlexTex has been shipped to a growing list of countries that are highlighted in orange. And, and, and the number of these countries increased further. It's now available as a much needed cost effective alternative to expensive robotic solutions. This is Dr. Faraz Khan from Dublin, Ireland, a colorectal surgeon who has used FlexTex for colon resection, the procedure that I showed you in the first few slides. And not only has he performed this procedure, he has published his work where he is explaining how FlexTex provides the functionality of a robot without the cost of the robot. Not just that, more importantly, he's using the, the technology, but he's also training other surgeons, which is a very strong validation of the efficacy of FlexTex in medical devices. When one surgeon trains other surgeons, that is what leads to adoption of the technology. There's a heartwarming story uh, which popped up in the news media last year about a young boy, six years old in London, and FlexTex was used to fix a, a kidney blockage in this instance. Uh, hydronephrosis was the condition and, and, and the child went back home in a few days. Yet another very significant procedure is radical prostatectomy. Prostatectomy is a procedure where if there's cancerous growth in the prostate gland, often happens with older males, and the prostate has to be removed. Once the prostate is removed, then the urethra has to be reconnected to the bladder. And again, you can see there's very fine suturing that is required here. Uh, Major Richard Knight has performed this very complex procedure at a U.S. Air Force base in the U.K. The same procedure has been performed by Dr. Amadio in Italy. The same procedure has been performed by Professor Ion Komen uh, in Romania. And these are, by the way, some of the most renowned surgeons, the key opinion leaders in their respective specialties. Here's yet another procedure where FlexTex has made a big impact, and that is partial nephrectomy, where if there's a portion of a kidney that uh, develops a tumor, you cut out that portion, get rid of it, but whatever remains, you sew it shut, and the con remaining kidney continues to, to work uh, and, and, and serve the, the, the individual. Uh, so for the suturing, as you can, again, appreciate this uh, FlexDex that uh, has been used quite extensively, uh, Dr. Simone uh, Crevillero has published his findings, and he talks about FlexDex being a cost-effective alternative to robotic technology provides comparable clinical outcomes. This is Dr. Alex Chapman, a part of the National Health Service in UK, who has done uh, several partial nephrectomies and more importantly, has run several training courses to teach other surgeons on how to conduct partial nephrectomy using FlexTex. One of the surgeons, Dr. Ignacio Vela, who attended uh, Dr. Chapman's uh, training session, after learning how to do this, he came back to Spain and performed the first partial nephrectomy in Spain using FlexTex. And he also talks about providing the advantages of robotic surgery at a much lower cost. Further examples of this in, in Brazil by Dr. Mariano. Yet another procedure in bariatric surgery, this is gastric bypass, that is called gastric sleeve surgery. In both cases, there's extensive suturing that is required. Dr. Walter Leclerc, based in the Netherlands, is perhaps one of the most, maybe the most prolific users of FlexTex for these procedures in all of Europe. And again, not only has he done these procedures, he's trained lots of other surgeons on how to do these procedures, having carried out multiple training courses. Unfortunately, this year, all of that has been put on hold for obvious reasons. This is Professor Peter Cosman performing bariatric procedures in Australia. This is Dr. Yatasir uh, performing these bariatric procedures in Turkey. The Whipple procedure is one of the nastiest and most complex procedures that results when there um, is cancer in, in the pancreas, several organs have to be removed and there's extensive reconstruction that has to be done, which means a lot of suturing is required. 
Professor Baki Topol is the first surgeon in the world to have used FlexTex for this complex procedure and has now become a regular user of FlexTex. Yet another part of the world, Dr. Mo Bilal, has used FlexTex for Whipple procedure. Again, what I'm showing you are just the samplings. There are hundreds and hundreds of surgical procedures where FlexTex has been used around the world. On a lighter note, if you happen to be the dog of a rich person, then FlexTex has been used by Dr. Charles Kunz, um, again, a, a renowned veterinary surgeon in Australia, to perform life-saving procedures on dogs. Overall, here's a list of surgical specialties that are impacted by FlexTex, and this list continues to grow as the technology is expanded to a full suite of surgical instruments and not just a needle driver. Uh, uh, this is my last slide. I just want to point out that any such effort takes a village and is a long journey. This is a picture from 2018 when our Brazilian distributor was, was visiting the company. You see all the smiles, but I have to say that this is not all peaches and roses. In fact, the current coronavirus situation has taken its toll on a small startup because elective surgery has been suspended for a while and just recently resumed. Also, any startup has to struggle with funding, sales, marketing, manufacturing, supply chain, quality issues every single day. There's an exceptional team of individuals who are um, who are embracing these challenges on, an, on a day-to-day -day basis. As far as I'm concerned, after having spent many years launching this company, I took a leave from the university to launch the company, I've now returned to the university and I'm cooking my next set of ideas and innovations. With that, I'm going to conclude. Thank you very much for your time and I will take any questions that there may be. Thank you so much, Shoria. That was really fascinating. I especially appreciated the, the financial impacts of this versus robotic surgery and and being at Mayo Clinic, I, uh, we do a lot of ergonomic studies to save our surgeons in um, this, uh, this type of ergonomic risk setup that would be very impactful, absolutely. So I do have a few questions line up. Let me get to the first one. Uh, were there any challenges in convincing surgeons to try to use the device for the first time? Oh, tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hope there are no surgeons in the audience, and if there are, please accept my apology ahead of time. I think it is extremely difficult to change the opinions and habits of surgeons, and in fact, for good reason. Uh, when when uh, someone is performing a procedure, uh, it's someone's life and death uh, that is at stake, and if there is a process and a set of instruments that already exist, perhaps it's painful to use them, but they do the job. It is, um, surgeons tend to stick to existing uh, methods and, 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 and uh, procedures and instruments. So it did take a lot of convincing. And I have to tell you that of all the things I've shown you, Flextex is still struggling every day in sales and marketing to convince surgeons to try it. Try it once, stick to it. And in some instances that has happened, in other instances, it is work in progress. Thank you so much. You actually uh, looped in, I think, question, the second question as well in terms of what was the challenge to getting uh, this logical device out, out to folks. Um, I mean, I would just add that, you know, we, we know that surgeons' careers end early because of neuropathies and the issues, risk. Yeah. And um, I, I think, yeah, it takes a long time for, for, to be um, convinced that they'd receive benefit from this. Are you willing to share as a last question your um, any other advances on the horizon in your work? I, I will, yeah, but I, there's one other question here that I find very fascinating okay. that I'd like to answer. I believe Brian asked, very interesting work, why do you think people had missed the reasonable cost, high functionality space for so long with these type of devices? Now, I'll give you my honest answer. I don't think people missed that space. If you look through the patent literature, if you look at the number of papers published and number of devices that were commercialized, you would find perhaps a hundred examples, but none of them made a market traction. So it is not as though I was the smartest person. I mean, this is one of those obvious problems that is out there uh, that everyone knows, everyone sees that wide open space. And there's a lot of very clever, very um, you know, fascinating solutions that are out there. I feel like we, ended up making some dent, some impact, for the sole reason that we did not see this problem as a problem of instrument design. We saw this as a problem in the design of a human instrument interface, as a problem between the surgeon and the instrument, looking at that as a system 
as opposed to the tool as a mechanical system and then handing it to a surgeon and say, go use it. I believe because uh, we, we acknowledge that, we address that, that's why we've had some success. Thank you, sure. We need to uh, move on to okay. our speaker. Thank you for that very interesting. Yes, thank you so Thanks. much. Congratulations on the award. Thank you very much. All right, so next we have uh, Dr. Jill McNick Gray. Uh, Dr. McNick Gray is a distinguished professor in science and engineering at the University of Southern California, where she is the director of the USC Biomechanics Research Laboratory. Dr. McNick Gray's interdisciplinary research focuses on the neuromuscular control and dynamics of human movement. She is actively involved in translation of science into practice and outreach programs that provide informal STEM educational experiences. Dr. McNick Gray received the USC Mellon Culture of Mentoring Award for her work with the Women in Science and Engineering Program and a USC Mellon Mentoring Award for her work with undergraduate students. Today, Dr. McNick Gray is going to share her mentoring experience in biomechanics with us in her PyTel Award talk entitled, Becoming a Mentor. I'd like to welcome Dr. McNick Gray, and we'll have a recorded presentation followed by live Q&A uh, after the video. Welcome, and thank you to ASB for shining a spotlight on the value of mentorship and diversity. I am truly honored by this award. Jean was a mentor of mine at Penn State. She received her PhD in biomechanics from Penn State, was an ASB founding member, and as faculty and later a dean, she knew the power of one and the importance of supporting women as they navigate the rigors of engineering science and mechanics. Becoming a mentor requires some internal reflection, and it was Jean that reminded me to remember who I was and what I enjoyed. So a place to start your reflection is to think about your own path. In my case, I was lucky to find biomechanics at the intersection of two things I really enjoyed, math and sports. Growing up, I was privileged to have math teachers and coaches who brought out the best in me and really encouraged me to take a path less traveled. After working in industry, I discovered that I liked research. And while at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill, I was fortunate to work with Barney Laveau, who was a physical therapist, and had earned his PhD at Penn State. It, while at Penn State, it was Jean who really encouraged me to get involved with ASV, and I'm really glad I did. At annual meetings, I look forward to sharing my results to other researchers who are interested in sports biomechanics, and I really enjoy the time in the hallways between sessions talking about things we're all uncertain of. After Penn State, I went on to USC where I am now a full professor in biomedical engineering and biological sciences. When I look back on my pathway, my, I see my roots really come from brave women and male allies along the way who have helped me become the person I am today. If you're watching this video recording, please pause and take a moment to reflect on your own passions and your own path and think a little bit about where you are on the mentoring spectrum. Are you an advisor who consumes graduate students to advance your own career, or do you see yourself more of a developer of the next generation of thinkers and doers? I see myself more as a developer or a coach there to help students find their own path and develop the skills they're, need, they're going to need to follow their own path. Most of my lessons have been learned from working with my students and they have taught me well. In this session, I'm grateful to have the opportunity to share some of our experiences along the way and have invited a number of my students to share their perspective as being a mentee and how those experiences have influenced them as a mentor. The re video recording of this session is organized to promote discussion. It is organized in three sections and allows time to pause, reflect, and generate your own shop thoughts on these topics. The first topic is valuing our time together, particularly as we advance knowledge through the research process. The second area is to talk about how diversity has helped us become better researchers and better people. 
And the third topic is to talk about the importance of creating learning opportunities for students to find their own path, but also develop the required skills so they can do what they love, love what they do, and do it well. Hi, I'm Allison Sheets Singer from Nike. To me, a mentor is someone who's there for me, both as a scientist and as a person. There's someone I can reach out to with questions or for additional perspectives. There's someone that sees potential in me and opportunities that I wouldn't have seen. I can't imagine that I would have had this career that I love without such great mentorship along the way. And there are two moments that really stand out. And both times I've turned to Jill for her mentorship. The first was in graduate school when the end seemed so far away and I wasn't sure I could make it. And the second was when I was a faculty member and deciding whether to transition into becoming a corporate scientist. Both times Jill listened patiently and asked wonderful questions that helped me figure out the path that I wanted to take moving forward. As I'm fortunate enough to become a mentor to others, those are the lessons I pull forward. I try and be there for the mentor mentee and I also try and help them find their way. So I'd like to take this moment to congratulate Jill on being the Jean Landa Patel Award winner for mentoring and inclusion. I can't think of a more deserving recipient. Congratulations, Jill. Of mentoring ties in with the expression, it takes a village. Even though mentorship is about two individuals working together, mentoring shows us that our pursuits should be integrated within healthy, supportive networks that we grow and care for collectively. This is what I learned from my most influential mentor, Professor Jill McNichray. She is exemplifying a mentor right now. During her time to be honored, she is most committed to find creative ways to connect with ASB and listen to others. Jill introduced me to opportunities and people who are now part of my broader network of mentors and collaborators. She helped me find a way to interweave my background and personal interest into research and teaching practices. She was able to do this because she emulates what she learned from her mentor, Professor Pytel, to find your passion. As Jill's mentee, the bar for being a mentor is set very high. Striving towards Jill's expert levels as a mentor, my primary goals are to establish trust and share opportunities that will enable my mentees to carve their own paths. I hope you've enjoyed hearing from my mentees and their reflections on their path as well as how they see themselves as a mentor. In this next section, we'll be talking about valuing the advancement of knowledge together. Advancement of knowledge is an iterative process. And we have found that it's important to take time to fully understand the problem in context. Once we've identified the problem, we can go back in time and ask ourselves, what just happened? And through experimentation and model simulation, we can figure out how and why things work the way they do. Using these what-if scenarios and experimental evidence, we can then begin to identify feasible solutions that can begin to address the problem. We have found that by applying a rigorous approach over time, we're able to generate a strong and flexible base that fosters growth and understanding. You can think of these series of steps like rings in a tree trunk. Some years support growth better than others. And we see the fluctuations coincide with the learning and doing as students progress. We have found that advancement of knowledge benefits from different points of views and that different perspectives provides meaningful insights. This approach builds on our firsthand experiences in sports as well as our coach athlete driven research. We can think of the relationship between mentee and mentee, mentor, as a partnership, just like a coach and an athlete. And it's based on TOC, trust, listening, with clarity of purpose. Team workers involved, and each individual is expected to take on multiple roles and responsibilities. As with any venture of human performance, it requires maintaining balance, during a variety of dynamic activities. In addition, there's a personal willingness and commitment to prepare to play and do the work needed to advance the knowledge and embrace multiple learning opportunities to learn, be tested, and advance understanding together. The essential ingredient to succeed in these pathways is time together. 
our USC Biomechanics Research Lab has grown in three primary areas over the last 30 years or so. One area is in experimentation and context. Another is experimentally based model simulation. The third is translation of science into evidence-based practices. These directions reflect the different pathways students in my lab have elected to pursue. We also focus on STEM outreach and reach out to students at key transitions along their pathway, that being from middle school to high school, high school to college, and college and beyond. It's important to remember this fully developed tree reflects over 30 years of research. It's important to realize that you can do it all, but likely not all at once. It's important to trim, water regularly, enrich the soil, and by all means, take time to enjoy the sunshine. So let's take a pause and take time to reflect about how your group determines which problems to investigate. Is this driven by funding mechanisms or is it simply a meaningful problem of interest to the group? In addition, think a bit about how your team actually goes about clarifying key research questions to investigate. Is this done with time apart, time together, or time with others in the field? When I think about Jill, the first thing I think about is questions. She's always asking questions. And she started at the beginning of my training teaching me how important it was to ask the right question. And it sounds trivial, but it is something that has benefited me in my career ever since. Just seeing the challenges that people find in asking the right questions and helping guide them into asking the right questions. It's such a skill. Having a mentor I felt very comfortable with, who embraced my graduate degree journey, who stood with me side by side, figuring things out together, providing me with the right amount of guidance and feedback, but gave me the opportunity to figure things out, who allowed me to pave my own career path, who is humble, smart, hardworking, Jill, all of this. In this section, we'll talk about how welcoming diversity invites growth. Okay, so what happens when a mathematician, an engineer, and a physical therapist walk into a biomechanics lab? What you get is perspective. You see that there are multiple approaches and perspectives to invite growth. We see this in how we, in, our, in the movements that we study, we see this in the perspectives of the people that study them, and our athletes tell us with their actions that there is more than one path to improve performance. And we need to be looking for ways to personalize solutions that are based on X mechanics that work for them. When I think about advancing women in STEM fields, I think about words of wisdom from Doris Miller, who, who said, whatever you do, do it well. People respect good work. And soon, if there's any biases out there, they will melt away. She did recognize that it might be best to publish without my first name. When we think about lowering barriers for advancement, we need to start by facing history. When I started, there was approximately 10 women in tenure track positions in STEM fields at USC. By 1994, I was tenured with a mother and a mother of two. In 2000, we were fortunate that for the establishment of a, a WISE program for women in science and engineering that was funded by an anonymous donor who recognized the need to support women in STEM fields. Here we are in 2020, we have approximately 70 women in tenure track positions in STEM fields. Many are tenured or have received NSF career awards at a rate equivalent to their male counterparts. When we look at Black, Indigenous, and people of color, we can be better and need to be better. As found with our research process at our own lab, building the WISE program has required time together in the form of monthly brown bag lunches. These are come-as-you-are events that are easy to sustain and are low cost. The resources gained through the endowment has enabled us to provide matching resources. So 
so that we can partner with others to fill gaps and lower barriers. This has required a long-term commitment to each other and to ourselves, built on trust, reflection, refinement, and creating a model that can be scaled. It's important that we have been brave and have had taken time to have those difficult conversations, to listen and reflect. What we've learned very clearly is equality is not equity. Different life paths need different support at different times. And there's significant different challenges in different disciplines. And this needs to be incorporated and reflected in the programming provided by the Women in Science and Engineering program. So when I think of equity, I think about facing history, thinking globally, and acting locally. Diversity truly invites growth. As I think about our human performance research and sport, our Paralympics athletes have really shown us what's possible. It's not about what you can't do. It's about what you can do. And consistent with the disability community motto of nothing about us without us really emphasize the importance of inclusion throughout all processes. And it also reminds us that sports fosters skills for life. So when reflecting on how diversity can invite growth in ASB, think about whether our current structures for advancement actually foster exclusion or inclusion. When we face history in 1977, 9% of the founders were women. We progress now to 2020, where women now make up about 50% of the student members and 30% of the regular members. We're not doing so well in the area of Black, Indigenous, and people of color. And we can do better and need to be better. And part of that is taking a personal step forward to grow and be part of the solution so that we can lower barriers, provide support, and develop allies as we move forward. This requires us all to do our homework. Silence isn't an option, and we need to become an accomplice. Congratulations on the Jean Landa Pytel Award for Diversity Mentorship in Biomechanics. Your mentorship has allowed me and many others to explore biomechanics by sharing your experiences and by creating an accepting environment for us to learn in. Your actions have provided access to knowledge which would otherwise be unavailable to many of us. This is the true value of mentorship. This level of support has inspired me to push further in my own education and to get even more involved in mentorship. Through involving the USC Biomechanics Lab in STEM outreach events such as National Biomechanics Day and the Wheelchair Games, I've learned how I can still mentor and give back to my community as a student. I will continue to push for the desperately needed diversity in STEM by sharing my own experiences and by introducing STEM topics to underrepresented groups using sports. Thank you, Dr. McNick Gray, for your guidance and mentorship. From firsthand experience, I know that you are truly deserving of this honor. The first is your ability for work-life integration. Uh, it's less of a balance, more of a skill, and accessible only true, through true commitments and real boundaries. When you have demonstrated the ability to stay committed to your goals, committed to your family, uh, the ability to demonstrate clear boundaries, that is how uh, work-life integration is accessible. And I've carried that with me now as a, a working mom of two, and I learned that from you. In this section, we talk about the importance of creating learning opportunities for learners to find their own path. As a mentor, I seek learning opportunities so that my mentees can connect their interests and develop the skills that they will need. Early on, I try to create time and opportunities for them to explore their intersecting interests. Along the way, I try to provide experiences and sets of opportunities for them to develop the skills and expertise they will need to be at the decision-making table down the road. To do this requires cultivating environments and collaborations that bring out the best in everyone. Later, I encourage the students and mentees to share their expertise and that to teach one and spark joy on wonder. We have found that taking the learning experiences that we've integrated into our undergrad research program translates well into some of our STEM outreach programming. 
by students getting real world experience, they gain confidence. And this is particularly important as students make their way in the state. By developing learning opportunities, we've also been able to create sustainable and meaningful collaborations. Another area that we've been able to develop with the Rancho Research Institute is creating a think tank where we can bring students at USC integrated with some of the clinicians and patients at Rancho develop innovative ideas for assistive devices. So it's time to take a pause and think about your power of one. As a mentor, um, you are a great role model. Um, you walk the walk, well, you talk the talk and walk the walk. Um, you are always uh, positive and patient towards students, um, and you did so organically, and we truly appreciate it. Um, one thing that stick with me the most is that you always have uh, a one-liner that uh, summarizes the point. And, have, and I have used so many of them with my students. Uh, for example, you always said that, oh, don't make it big, but do it well. Thanks for spending some time with us today in the session so that we could share our lessons learned. As you can see, my students have taught me well. So as you go forth in this virtual ASB learning environment, be present, participate, listen, build trust, gain clarity through diverse viewpoints and reflect. I encourage you to be brave, learn, pass it on, and enjoy the process by creating your own zip line and making connections between yourself and others in your field of interest. But most important, important, I hope that you will do what you love, love what you do, and do it well, and encourage others to do so. Thank you to Jean for being my mentor and helping me be me and finding my passion and becoming an expert in my field. Thank you to the students who have shared their um, insights on mentoring both in our interactions, but as how they're looking at mentoring as they go forward in their own careers. Special thank you to Nathan Phillips, who helped me, uh, mentored me on my Adobe Premiere editing debut. And if you're interested in the messages, the full clips for my students, it can be found at our website. All right, thank you, Jill, uh, for that excellent presentation. Um, I'd like to encourage people, if you have questions for Jill, uh, to type them into the chat. Um, I think we have uh, too large a group, perhaps, to have people unmuting. Um, uh, you have. I will, uh, okay. waiting for people to do that. I'd just like to say, Jill, that you've not only been a mentor, uh, to a number of people who've worked with you, uh, but you've also been a tremendous role model to so many more people. Uh, your impact has been incredibly broad. One of the things that really struck me in your talk was this idea, we tend to think of mentoring as something you do to someone else, that it's a, it's a one-way street. I was wondering if you could comment more on your thoughts about sort of the bi-directional nature of that. I think it's really true that becoming a mentor is really about my students teaching me because if I'm paying attention, I can get a sense of kind of where they are, where they want to go, and then figure it out how to give them space to grow, but at the same time guide them at the same, you know, the same way. So it's, it's, it's very interactive. It's very individual, but it, for me, um, being a coach previously and being trained as a, it just fits, right? So it's not about my life and me, it's about helping them get to where they want to go. And part of that's individual path, but also the creative teamwork too. So um, it, it's a process you go to on together and you develop your skills as you go. And I think the biggest thing is really having that trust relationship so you can have the difficult conversations, be better at what you're trying to do and really work together. Thanks. Uh, we have a question from Irene Davis. Sometimes students are not sure of their path. How do you guide them in finding the start of their own path? This is really true because when a student comes into your lab, I, I start the process when I actually recruit students to my lab. I call their mentors who wrote the letters of recommendation and learn more about them as a student. 
how they learn because I know they're going to come to this new space and I'm trying to foster an environment where they can really thrive. So if I understand kind of what their pathway has been from someone else who's mentored them, I have a much better perspective of kind of where to start. After that, it's it's iterative. You know, you, you get them started in what you think they might like, but then you also give them changes and opportunities along the way to change directions should they want to. And this has really been helpful because we do experimentally based modeling. So some people find themselves more in the modeling side. Some people find themselves in the experimental side. And this allows them some space in between where they can easily move and navigate. So it's, it's really helpful to have long-term relationships with Henry Flaster, for example, in aerospace and mechanical engineering. Because I know I, I'm not gonna be the only person teaching them. I wanna have that network so those students can really find their path and get expertise that they need. And it's not gonna all come from me. And the other thing that's pretty cool is they're all learning from each other too. So that makes it fun. So we have a question from Matt Seely. Uh, Jill, thanks for that excellent talk. How do you balance patiently waiting for students to learn and, pro and progress while still getting things done in an efficient manner? Well, I think this is, you know, back to matchmaking. Uh, I'm recruiting students who want to be in my lab. So this is taken on as a, with an open mind and an open heart and really willing to do the work. And um, so th that matching is really important because if I find this, if students talk to me, they want to come to my lab, but I find out that their heart and soul somewhere else, I try to get them into the, the lab that they should be in. So uh, there's no, I don't find myself waiting around a whole lot. I find them that usually people who are in my lab want to be there and it becomes very, you know, it's still interactive in that you're trying to figure out where their path is, but there are going to be things that they do well. There's going to be things that they love. It's going to be obvious. And, you know, those are areas that I already know these are paths we're going on anyways. So it just blends in, you know, so it might be how I give them roles and responsibilities. And from that, they can really test it out. If they find out they're on the wrong path, that's okay too. You can also join in more on the other side of things. So it's, it's progression and progress. So there are going to be some nice congratulations for you in the chat. I would encourage you to go read when this is done. One final question from Allison Sheets Singer. How did you find your voice and philosophy as a mentor? I don't know. That's a great question. Um, I think I had a lot of brave women in my life. And I think it came from my coaches to really find my path and figure out who I was. And I, I think what's really cool about sports, and I've seen this in the, the students in my lab, is in sports you have every day, every practice, you get these iterations. You get better at finding your voice and you get to try, you get to fail, you get to learn again. It just, it's a, like you get to go through a lifetime every season and then kind of reflect on that and figure out how you can be better. And it's those women in that space, it's really great. So I think it's really important that we find ways to get more women out there coaching. Um, I think they've got a lot of things to offer. And, um, and as a, as a country, we need to get our kids back out there playing it. Cause right now it's, it's uh, I, I have great empathy for all you parents out there that are trying to figure out how you're going to balance three kids on your lap while writing a research grant. I've been there. I found that 10 PM to 2 AM is the best place to be getting help. All right. So we have one more item as part of this part of the uh, award session. And for that, I'm going to turn it back over to Missy. Thank you. Thank you for the inaugural 2020 Jean Landa Pytel Award. This opportunity to reflect together on diversity mentorship in biomechanics is dedicated to Mimi Ryan. Mimi was my first mentee in biomechanics while I was a PhD student at Penn State. She went on to earn her PhD in biomechanics for UCLA under the mentorship of Bob Greger. She was instrumental in our International Olympic Committee research project during the 1996 games in Atlanta. A wife, a mother of two who lost her battle with cancer this year, a great person and a friend. Thank you for the inaugural. All right, thank you for that really nice sentiment for Mimi Ryan and for all you've done, Jill. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. All right, we move now on to the Founders Award. And I will find my spot. Um, so our Founders Award winner is Tammy Bush, and she is an associate professor in the Department of Chemical Engineering at Michigan State University with an adjunct appointment in the Department of Bioengineering. 
She holds a position of faculty excellence advocate in the college. Broadly, Dr. Bush's area of research is whole body biomechanics. She's a fellow of ASME, a two-time recipient of the Withrow Teaching Award, and most recently receives MSU's Inspirational Woman Award for professional achievement. Dr. Bush is passionate about mentoring and has developed programs to provide engineering mentorship to women and underrepresented students. Today, Dr. Bush is going to share her biomechanics research and mentoring experience in her Founders Award talk titled, Challenges with Injury and Disease in Biomechanics. Welcome, Dr. Bush. Thanks so much, Missy. And thank you, I'm honored to be receiving this award. Before I start my talk though, um, I'd like to acknowledge this group of individuals. Since this award is around research and mentoring, I'd like to um, thank Chris, Joan, Kim, Jill, and Wendy, all who helped with and supported my founder's nomination. Not only that, but they have provided advice on numerous occasions and served as mentors to me. So thank you very much. Also, my talk is going to take a little bit of a different overview. It's not a standard research talk. Um, I'm going to talk about some experimental work I do around injury and disease, but I'm going to focus on a team approach. Actually, my talk parallels Jill's quite nicely, and we didn't plan that. Um, so I'm going to demonstrate this team approach on a topic associated with tissue properties for wheelchair users. And then I'm going to deviate a little bit and talk about some of my experiences with mentoring for the second half. So first, I want to share with you a little bit about our group. I'm a mechanical engineer. The majority of the students in my group are either mechanical or bioengineers. However, we have a interdisciplinary group that includes folks from all different areas. I have some from material science. I have some who have worked in the prosthetic and orthotics field or studying to go in the prosthetic and orthotics field. I have a couple of folks who worked in kinesiology and helped with my lab. This is one lady who was also on the cross country team. Some folks from biosystems and uh, I've worked with individuals in the lab with human medicine and osteopathic medicine. This is Amber. She's one of the students who recently graduated from my lab. So the issue we're focusing on today is soft tissue injuries. They're also called pressure ulcers or pressure injuries. And you can see a picture. Um, <laughs> this is similar to Shora's uh, research with a graphic photo of something not so pleasant. Um, and it occurs or develops in wheelchair users. The cause is seated pressures for prolonged periods of time, which lead to reduced blood flow. And then these pressures also cause high internal stresses. 50 to 60% of the wheelchair users develop these um, pressure injuries, and typically they're on the buttocks and thighs. They're prone to infection, they're deep, they're painful, and they affect the activities of daily living for all of these individuals. So we've done quite a bit of research in the area of pressure injuries. Uh, this is an outline of all of the publications we have in that area. I don't have time to talk about all of those, but I wanna focus on the experimental work associated with our most recent publication. So as I said, internal stresses are things that are related to or prime factors that form pressure ulcers. But you can't evaluate internal stresses directly. So we have to evaluate those through another means. And we use human body models. So as you see over here on the right, we have a human body model of the thigh, and they're used to estimate these internal stresses. Now, the output of your model relies heavily on what you use for input criteria, particularly around the material properties. Many of these models have used uh, human cadaver tissue, or they've used animal studies and animal tissues. They're really limited in vivo human data sets, and the ones that are available occur in the prone position, so someone lying down, or they have two points, loaded and unloaded, which we know the biological tissues are highly nonlinear, so a two-point data set really doesn't capture all of the effects of um, the tissue properties. So our question was, how do we obtain in vivo human data? Well, of course, we want a seated position because we're talking about wheelchair users and they're in the seated position for the more majority of their day. We'd like to get a continuous data set, not just two points. We'd also like to be able to test different regions along the buttocks and thighs. 
And to do this, we've developed a special apparatus. We have a chair down here, and we have an instrumentation over here on the right, which allows us to gather force deflection data sets. So it would be like you're sitting on a park bench. You sit down and the bench squishes your tissues upward. Well, we can do that with a um, indenter as well as what we call it and obtain continuous force deflection data sets. So to do this, if you see the image over here, we have a laboratory chair. We have sections of the chair that can be removed either along the back or along the seat pan at different regions to gather sections of data along different body segments. The chair is elevated so the tester can get underneath the chair and access the tissues of the individual being tested. Because of the height, the individual does have to step up to get into this chair. So we just started by testing able-bodied individuals and it worked well for this group, but not necessarily ideal for wheelchair users. Uh, at a minimum, they would have difficulty transferring in and out. Um, there might be challenges with each board remover. And because it's elevated, we'd have to figure a way to get them up to that height or to lower the chair down. Well, we're not the experts in that. We're, our area of expertise is really around mechanics. So we consulted with outside team members. We have, um, we're fortunate to have a group of individuals we work with. There is an adaptive sports group on campus that we consult with frequently. There's also a um, set of physical therapy clinics in the mid-Michigan area. And right on campus, there's a wound care clinic. So we consulted with this group, particularly our adaptive sports group and the physical therapist, and asked them about this problem. First, we took our chair over to the Adaptive Sports Club, and they have wheelchair rugby, uh, wheelchair tennis, among many other sports that they do, and they meet weekly. Um, Justin, who's the graduate student working on this project, took the chair over there and conducted a series of interviews. And we found several things that they um, pointed out. Well, it's too high, but they could solve that problem if we had a ramp and we wheeled up to the, the seat height. Um, they couldn't transfer into it as, as it is, but if we added some arm supports that they could grasp onto across the seat, they might be able to slide into the chair. Some people said that it just wouldn't be possible for them. They couldn't sit in it with the chair sections removed due to core strength issues. And then others said, well, it would be nice to also have some head or lateral supports to support them while sections of the chair were being pulled away for testing. So we took this back to the lab and we talked about it as a group and said, well, what do we need to do to accommodate the participant, accommodate them, not make our participants accommodate us. So we first thought if we kept this chair in the lab, well, they'd have to come into the lab. My lab's on the fourth floor. It's in the engineering building, which is in the central campus. Of course, campus parking is not easy, uh, not pleasant to navigate. And depending on the time of the year they came, they may or may not need to use the restroom and change into clothing. So just that step alone we thought was pretty inconvenient for them. And then we'd need to, mechanically we could do these, but we'd need to adjust the chair, either lower it or add a ramp, and then get rid of the slat system to have some slider system because we couldn't have people ingressing and egressing out of the chair, that too would be inconvenient. And then it would require the additional head or arm restraints, supports um, or lateral supports that they requested. So then we thought, well, what if we took the chair to the rehab facility? There's still several challenges, but those would be more on our end. So that's what we did. This is Justin here. And we went to a physical therapy clinic for the day and we told them what we wanted to do. We showed them pictures of the chair. We discussed the challenges. And this physical therapy clinic um, specializes in spinal cord injured individuals. And that's their main clientele. So they had a Hoyer lift. We put Justin in the Hoyer lift and we thought, well, maybe this is a possibility. It is a, a harness type system that places you in a seated position and, and swings you onto an arm mechanism. But unfortunately, that system already compressed the tissues. So we wouldn't be able to get the force deflection or that squish that we were interested in. So then the therapist took us over to this image here you see on the right, it's called a therapy cage. And they said, well, we put uh, our patients in this posture frequently. We have them lie down. We put support bands on, on their um, thorax and under their pelvis. We then attach these essentially um, bungee cords that tighten up to the ceiling. We lower the table and then we place the individual in a series of postures. 
and one that's pretty common is the quadruped posture or a crawling posture and we use this for therapy amongst other things we thought well that's an interesting idea that would work that exposes the tissues and gives us access to those regions also making it part of the therapy routine um, reduces the inconvenience for the participant so that led us to another study which was looking at the seated posture the quadruped posture and the prone posture all together with a group of individuals probably this this study wouldn't have come about had we not consulted those therapists we thought the quadruped posture could be a good analog to the seated position it has the same joint angles the same tissue tensions uh, main difference would be that gravity was acting in a different orientation so we brought in a group of 20 able-bodied individuals both men and women and we compared these three postures. Now remember, we selected prone because it's an easy posture, but also uh, there are some data sets, although limited, available on uh, human data in the prone position. So this is what we found. If we look up here, black and blue are um, the seated and quadruped data, and there are no significant differences in between these two sets of data. These are the average and the solid lines with the confidence intervals on the dotted lines. However, the prone is in the red position. The prone was stiffer and it was significantly stiffer than in the seated and quad postures, but there were no significant differences in the seated and quadruped postures. So it turns out that that's a pretty good choice for us to use if we're interested in tissue testing in the seated position. So we headed to the clinic, we got our IRB approvals, and we um, recruited some participants. We had the support bands for positioning, as I said earlier. We also put an um, inflated ball or peanut, and they had various sizes there at the clinic that we could use for each individual to provide torso support. And then we had sandbags that were positioned in, in front of the ball and in front of the knees or on the sides of the knees to prevent movement of the participants or sliding of the participant as Justin um, applied the force and we recorded the deflection. We had 10 individuals who participated. They all had a spinal cord injury. We tested, oh, can you still hear me? We tested, we tested um, three regions, both the left and right uh, sides, three regions along the thighs, and we found if we look here, this is the average able-bodied data. And over here are our spinal cord injured data sets. And the majority of them show a decreased stiffness. This is for the proximal thigh, which is a region near or under the issue of tuberosities. If we look at all three thigh regions, the issue of tuberosity region is one I just showed you. The middle thigh, it too shows a significantly softer or decreased stiffness compared to our able-bodied data sets. However, when we get near the knee, the distal region is much stiffer. So these are our most recent data sets uh, that we've gathered, and we're in the process of um, getting some MRI data sets that we can then implement subject-specific models for um, these data. So in terms of outcomes, we successfully obtained data from wheelchair users, and we had a unique and very unexpected experimental approach that I don't think would have developed had we not interacted with such a diverse group of individuals. These, this, the results of this research and the data are gonna to lead to improved human body models, which are gonna affect device design, such as cushions, prosthetics, because those who interact with soft tissues, and automotive seating and safety because of occupant positioning and that information that occurs in the buttocks and thighs. So through the integration of partners, we were able to better understand the needs of our participants. Now, we don't just do this with one area of research. I actually have another area that focuses on osteoarthritis of the hands, and we incorporate our work uh, with hand therapists. They help us understand what the patient goes through and the challenges that occur with this disease. Hand surgeons, they remove uh, bones from the hand to reduce pain of, of, of their patients. So they help us understand what sort of limitations they have after surgery. We have an age alive community, and that group is a mid-Michigan group that's 65 and older. 
and they've discussed the challenges and activities of daily living with osteoarthritis. And you might wonder, what is this over here? Well, this is an octopus, and we're collaborating with some folks in neuroscience where we're actually going to study the reach of an octopus and to help us better inform reach and grasp of humans and a possibly a new prosthetic design. So again, we have a um, very interdisciplinary team that we work with to help us understand our research and the project and the needs. So with that, I'm gonna move on to mentoring. I'm gonna start, so it gives you a little bit of a perspective about me and where this mentoring uh, comes from and my thoughts on it. So I was an undergraduate in mechanical engineering well, I was an undergraduate, I never had a female instructor. During my master's and my PhD, I had one class with a female professor. In 2009, when I started at MSU in ME, I was one of only two female faculty in the department of 39. It was the first time ever in the history of the department that they actually had two women in the department or more than one woman. That was the maximum they had had. And the first female professor, or being promoted to the rank of full, happened only three years ago. So I have great colleagues in my department, great male colleagues, and when I started there were just a few women. So I think this is where my passion comes to mentor and work with female students. And I'm going to talk about some of my, some of my experiences in that area. So I've partnered with the Society of Women Engineers. And we do some mentoring, it's called shopping with the ladies. And no, it is definitely not that kind of shopping. It is an event in the machine shop. It's hands on taught by women. This is freshmen and sophomore. And we have senior level women who are in ME and are about ready to graduate. And we break them into groups and we teach them the drill press the lathe, the mill, and the bandsaw. And why we do this is twofold. One, to support the fact that we have four design and build classes in um, mechanical engineering. So it's really important that they know how to use the machine shop. Also, it gives them an opportunity to meet me, and then they know they have a contact in mechanical engineering, and I have an open door policy. So they can stop by, and many do, uh, once they reach their junior year and are starting to take the ME courses. Another quick story. Well, I, when I first started attending ASB, I was an early career faculty member and I went to this event called a Women in Science event. And I walked down to the cafeteria or the dining facility very, very early morning. And I sat down at a, few ta at a table with only a few women and I didn't know anyone there. And um, shortly after I sat down, this guy sits down. And I think to myself, this is an event for women in science. There weren't any men there, but Richard Hughes was there and he sat down across from me and we started talking. He talked about his research, I talked about my research, and then I um, gathered the courage to say, you know, I thought this was a woman in science event. Um, how come you're attending it? And he said, well, I'm very supportive of women in science. I feel I should be and I should let women know that I'm very supportive of them being here and I'm happy to mentor them and provide advice. So shortly after that conversation, Jill sat down and Jill joined the conversation and we started talking about the tenure stream, women in science, challenges, um, and these guys started giving me and all the other people at the table some excellent advice. Some things, and Jill mentioned this in her talk, this is my interpretation of it, which was show up. So go to the meetings, go to the events, get involved and connect to the ASB members because ASB members are really great and they're willing to give their time, their resources. I had a new class that I had to teach and I consulted with a bunch of ASB folks, uh, several who gave me some of their material. At that time, at that table, in that one hour, I received some key mentoring advice and had a key mentoring experience. I don't think I really realized it and it's not until later on that I started thinking about it that I realized how valuable it was to just go to that one woman in science event. And since then, you know, Richard kind of surprised me being a, a man at the women's event, but that's very typical for ASB. 
I want to say there are a lot of very supportive men and women in this society. So if you're new to the society or you're a student, make sure you take a, uh, the opportunities and um, attend the events. Use it to develop your leadership skills. And re it's really an opportunity to receive mentoring from some outstanding scientists. And they're very, very nice and very willing to give their time. So before I go, I have, of course, I have to thank my team, you know, the, my group, 2018, 2019. After one of our summer lab meetings, we met in the engineering courtyard, uh, had some uh, nice discussions and a couple photos. This was our summer group photo uh, from our Zoom meeting a couple of weeks ago. Uh, a little less uh, exciting, but I hope we all get back to this soon. And as Jill was saying, what do you do with your students? Well, we like to brainstorm doing crazy things. We did some paintball, we've done some paddle boarding, uh, we've done trivia night, which is uh, easy to do to, um, remotely. So um, thank you all and thank you ASB. I appreciate this uh, award and I'm really, really honored. Thank you so much, Tammy. That was wonderful. It's a great testament to um, our, our young ASB members to reach out to, to uh, folks in the society as we are all generally very willing to help. That's great. If you have questions, please put them in the chat box, please. All and as right. I did not consult with Jill, I didn't know yeah. it was going to be in her talk, so I kind of chuckled when I saw that. Um, let's see. Our, we have one from Jennifer Nichols. You have a lot of congratulations. You should check out the chat too as well. Um, Jennifer Nichols says, congrats and thanks for a great talk, Dr. Bush. I enjoyed how you talked about building teams and getting input from multiple stakeholders. What advice do you have on choosing the right team and finding supportive collaborators that help both your research and your trainees? Yeah, so I think that's a great question. Um, I think start by talking to a lot of folks and figure out, so for example, the hand surgeon and the hand therapist that I work with actually work together. So I knew they had a working relationship and um, they were both very interested in research and um, interested in new technology and advancement. So um, not only did I start to um, meet with them and kind of click with them and get excited with them, but I brought in students from the lab as well. And you could see right away that a team was forming and a mesh was forming with that group. So I think um, taking the extra effort to go visit them and interact with them for a little bit, and it might be, you know, I've had a lot of people who stop by and want to work with us in the lab, but maybe the interests aren't exactly paralleled. So you've got to find a, a group where you're all moving in the same direction, I think, for it to be successful. Wonderful. Next question is from Brian Umberger. Thanks so much, Tammy. I think you worked in the industry before academia. How does that influence your research and mentoring? I did do some work with industry. Um, and industry, actually, in terms of comparing the two, industry is much faster paced uh, in terms of getting things done and being really organized and having milestones. So I think that organization that I have came from this. Um, and I think that also affects my mentoring as part of my mentoring techniques. I have my students list out or navigate what they're going to do each week. And then um, uh, most of the time with my PhD students, I sit down with a bunch of sheets of paper on the wall and we map out where we see their research going and what all the possibilities are. And so those techniques actually came from industry. And I think they've morphed, I've used them for uh, academia as well. But yeah, thanks, Brian. Wonderful, if there's any additional questions, please put them in the chat. Okay, we just got one from Abby Hauser. How did you start to build connections with all of the adaptive sports groups, local PTs and other services to help create your device? And did you have any roadblocks with these connections? Thanks for accommodating your participants and not the other way around. As a disabled person, this rarely happens and I love seeing you emphasize it in your presentation. Thank you, great question. Um, so I let folks know that I was interested in working with um, individuals who had disabilities. 
and I wanted to know where the expertise was. And I talked to enough people. So it, it turns out that my neighbor was working with one of the physical therapy companies. And he said, you should come visit and talk to our owner. And so it was, that wasn't the first person that I had talked to. Um, I had talked to some folks on campus. I talked to um, individuals in, in academia. Um, but when I went to that rehab clinic and their focus on spinal cord injury and the fact that he, again, was really interested in the research and excited to hear what we had to do, so excited that he came down. Um, he too was a wheelchair user, came to, made the effort to come to MSU and visit the lab and talk with me. I knew then that that was the partnership group. But I'll, I'll tell you, I did have to reach out to a lot of people. The adaptive sports uh, group, actually Justin had um, been interacting with them and I have, so we have senior design projects and they sponsored a senior design project. And because of my research area, I was the faculty advisor. So Justin interacted that with them on one level and then I interacted with them on another level in terms of the senior design projects. And it's between those two um, pieces of involvement, that's how we became involved with the adaptive sports group. Um, actually, they've been featured on the Big Ten channel. They've got a couple videos. So they're a great group on campus. And it's my understanding that not, um, there's only a handful of universities that have such a group on campus. Um, and, and I was in contact with him right now talking about how they're dealing with COVID. But that's how I got connected is talking to a lot of people and um, letting them know who I was interested in working with and asking them, who do they know in those areas? That's great advice. Talk to your neighbors. Tell them what you do. You never know what kind of connections might come out of that. <laughs> that's wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Tammy, and congratulations on the Founders Award. And that's going to bring our session to a close. I have a few items to say, but first, I want to congratulate again, Shoria, Jill, and Tammy on your awards. Well deserved and your presentations were wonderful. And thank you for your flexibility with transitioning to this online format. Um, a few comments, the spatial chat rooms will be open after this. The Goyle room will be AMTI 1, Pytel will be in the National Biomechanics Day 4, and the Founders will be in AMTI 2. So you can shift over to those locations and, and keep the conversation going. Um, there is another award session tomorrow morning at 11 a.m. Eastern. That will be the pre-doc and post-doc awards along with the finalists for Journal of Biomechanics and Clinical Biomechanics. And then we'll have additional award acknowledgements and announcements um, at the business meeting on Friday at 1 p.m. Eastern. And again, this chat will be moved to the Slack discussion where you can discuss there, but there also right now will be the spatial chats, which we encourage you to attend and uh, keep asking great questions. Thank you, Brian, for helping me co-moderate and thank you all to our speakers and the attendees for your great questions and attention. Have a great evening. Congrats, everyone. Bye.